He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive. Good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter. One religion fail. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. Our free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor, he is friendship for the one the world ignores, he is pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive, for the good Lord. My name is Edward Bowles. Welcome to the Good Fight Church. If you haven't been here before, I, we say welcome home around here, so you guys feel free to say welcome home to one another. Um, something that we also do around here is we take up these Connect cards. These Connect cards help us get to know who you are, what's going on in your world. And one of my favorite things about them is that you can take that same card, you can flip it over on the back, and you can put your prayer request on there. And our team is going to be praying over those cards every single week. And it's just a way for us to engage one another and be community with one another. So take advantage of those Connect cards and that prayer card. You can take them also and you can drop them in the back. Right on either side of the sound booth, there's an opportunity to drop those prayers. If you're online with us tonight, you can type your prayer in there or you can private message and give us an opportunity to be in prayer for you and your family. Um, something else we do around here, I mentioned online already, is Facebook Live. It's an incredible opportunity to share with your family, with your friends, with the people who are just scrolling through Facebook right now what you're up to, what's important in your life, and give them the opportunity to hear the gospel. We engage thousands of people every single week through Facebook Live, and that's because you guys are liking and sharing. So click those links and make sure everybody knows what's going on in your world. Also, this week we have coming up is Testimony Tuesday. Yeah. That's Ari Pierce. He's right here front and center. So you guys look at him, make him feel weird. He will be sharing the testimony of how he is an overcomer and, uh, and how God is changing his life. That's going to be at 630 and it's at our main campus, Battlegrounds Coffee Shop, 500 East Main here in Yukon. So make sure and show up there. Also, we have groups coming up. Secret Church is firing up on April the 20th. It's going to start at 6 o'clock. This is a simulcast with David Platt. He's actually going to be talking about cults and the counterfeit gospel. I'm sure it's going to be incredibly engaging, so make sure and be a part of Secret Church. You can find out about this if you'll go online. 
and uh, you go online, you click connect, you click um, announcements, you scroll down, you find what you're looking for. Also, all the things that we're mentioning tonight are an opportunity to sign up if you want to go ahead and do that. And uh, you sign up, you say, hey, I'm interested in this, we'll contact you, we'll get you involved in what you want to be a part of. So, do me this favor, get ready for communion. Welcome home, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Great, great. It's uh, such an honor to be a part of this and uh, being able to do this with you guys. Um, in Ephesians 3.17, or 3, uh, verses 17 and 18, it says, Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And you may have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. And that's one thing I want us to be reminded of as we take communion tonight. Communion is for the believer, a person that has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so I want us to be remembered just how much, just how much God loves you as we take this tonight. Okay? It's so important that we be reminded of that he is coming back. Be reminded of what he's done for you on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and so that we would be able to take communion as we will tonight. The second thing we need to remember is that when he came, when he was here on earth the first time, he came as a servant. But when he comes back, when he comes back, he'll be coming back as a conquering king. Okay? The third thing I want you to be reminded of is the inner self our heart. And so in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So as I read that, I want us to take a moment to examine your heart. Okay? I want us to just stop. Stop thinking about what you're doing. What's going on in your mind? What's going on around you? And just take a moment with God. Okay? So let's do that. I'll give you a few minutes. And if you have anything that you need to confess, please do so now. Father God, we just we come to you, Father, as broken people, as sinners. And right now, as everybody is examining their heart, God, you see each and every one of us. And so, Lord God, forgive me of my sins. I mess up all the time, God, and I'm thankful that you're a loving God, that you're a forgiving God. And so, Father, as we take communion tonight, Help us to be reminded just what Jesus done for us. The love that he has for us. That he would die on the cross for us. And God, we just thank you so much that you sent him on this earth to do that very thing so that we could be reminded just how much he loves us as we take communion tonight. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It says on the night <clears throat> the Lord Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body that's given up for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup, he took the cup, and this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so, again, guys, it's so important that we be reminded what God done, what Jesus done for us on the cross. Okay? So tonight, we're going to start in the front. And as you make your way back from this, this, this seat right here, we'll go over to this side. And you folks on this side will go to here. And you'll get to your servers. And one server will hand you the bread and the drink. And then you step down to the next person, which is uh, uh, Gene and, and Kyle. 
and they'll pray for you guys. And we want to get groups of four to five to six people so that we can have a constant flow of this. So if you would, uh, Serena and, and Christy, would y'all start this way? And George and, and Barbara, would you start there? And as they go by, the next, next line, just go around. And as, as we play some music... It is such a beautiful sight to see groups of people praying. So again, as we get ready for to continue in our worship, I want to pray for us, for our service. Father God, thank you again for, Lord, just <clears throat> opening up your, your house to us tonight, God. I pray you be with Pastor John as he brings your message to us that you laid on his heart. Father, help us to open up our hearts and our ears to, to receive that word. God, we just thank you so much that we can have a place that we can come and gather as a family and, and listen to your word. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll return to worship. All right, you guys ready to worship now? That was a great start to our service, but let's stand and let's lift our voices tonight. Real quick for our people, that's the wrong slide. We need to go back to the previous song. be on the same page. It's only king forever. If it's not in there, can you grab it real quick? We'll get started. Hold on. I hate to, you guys 
not to have words. I want you to sing with us, right? Okay, we're going to go ahead and get, there we go. That's why I 
see your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be just love you and we just honor you tonight we love to lift our voices to you as a family God and we pray that you are just leaning your ear toward us tonight Lord it's such an honor to come together as a church family and to be able to hear your word and to be able to lift your voice to heaven and to honor you God we pray that you would be blessed tonight we pray that you would open our hear- ears to hear the message you want to share with us tonight Don't let us leave here without a true change in our hearts, God. Help us to know you more. Father God, we pray for all of those who are sick and aren't here tonight, God. We pray you give them healing in their bodies and that they're able to at least worship with us online, God. We love you and we honor you. We want to continue to lift our voices. We pray that you would help us to let go of any distractions that might be keeping us from giving you our total praise, God. Any worry, any sickness, any issues that are going on, God, They're all in your hands. You are our Father, and you have everything in your hands, God, and we don't want to worry about any of those, God. We lift them to you right now, and we ask that you help us to lift our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the arms of the Father, there is love like no other. He who formed all things offers love to me. 
Where you go, we will follow Through the dark, through the narrow And in all we do We are bound to you I want to be close Nothing in this world that compares to all you are. We are found in your presence, seeking you in your fullness. Give us. I see. So beautiful. All right. I want you to find somebody and shake their hand and tell them welcome home.
Well, 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 here we are. Am I on? Am I on? Hello. Hello, I'm John. Whoo, it's Saturday night. Here we are again. Welcome home, everybody. Welcome home. All right, Saturday night. When you walked in here, you probably heard someone say, welcome home to you. We say that because this is not a place where individuals come to worship God alone. This is a place where individuals come to worship God collectively as a family, and we want to be that family. You heard Edward when he was up here. There are connect cards in your seats. Fill those out. We want to be praying for you and with you, get to know you. Uh, it, but right now, go ahead and get your Bibles. There should be a Bible on your row. If you don't have a physical Bible, that's our gift to you. We're in Hebrews 8. If you'd rather follow, around, uh, follow along on your smart device, pull out your phone. You can download any of the free apps, the Good Fight Church app or the Bible app. It's all free. There's no reason not to have a Bible in front of you today. We're in a series called Hebrews. And for the past 15 sermons on Hebrews, we've been talking about the exaltation of Jesus. Tonight we're going to be in chapter 8, and it turns a little bit. So go ahead and turn to chapter 8. It's almost like 70 degrees right now, right? It's like 70 degrees. It's that time of the year. Yeah, everyone else on, online, they're like, yes, that's why we're not there. <laughs> Uh, but this time of year is, is kind of like the wedding season. You know, we're getting it going, and love is in the air. And I remember, yeah, like all the women are like, woo, and all the guys are like, what is he talking about, that noise? But it's getting close to wedding season, and, and people start getting excited about this. And, and you know what I'm talking about. If you're not married yet, you definitely know because you start thinking about it. And if you've been married just for a little bit, you, you know what I'm talking about. I remember 17 years ago about this time, I remember having to leave parties and leave events with my friends, and they're like, what are you doing? I said, i got to go home and call my fiancé. And that was back before we had cell phones. And so I was having to go and leave parties, and people are, are like, changing their schedules because love is in the air, and, and you're doing things and saying things because of the, the love that you have for someone, the love that they have for you. And so this time of the year, things get kind of weird. I've done... I, I've officiated probably 15, 16 different weddings in the past two years. To me, I'm not so excited about it. It's a ceremony, but I understand that love and the excitement because I don't think it's, it's really the ceremony itself. It's not. I think it's that the thought uh, of that love binding two people together, that they have this common ground, that they, they love each other so much that they're ready to make an oath to commit to one another for the rest of their lives. Uh, I, I, have you ever thought about that? When people get married, they don't say, let's go have a ceremony and sign the contract. They don't say that. They say, it's a covenant. Oftentimes you'll hear preachers, if you've ever heard me do one, I talk about, hi, this is a covenant between you, that person, and God. A contract, see, a contract, you never heard like, hey, let's go sign the contract. A, con a contract is based on disagreement. A contract would be like, hey, uh, you agree not to do this or I leave. Whereas a covenant is a common thread. It is an agreement of one's love for someone else and their love for that person as well. That's the difference. A contract in nature is selfish. It's self-serving. It's saying, what do I get out of this? What can I gain by this? Where a covenant is always selfless and it's always in agreement with the other party as well. Think about that. Whenever you, you hear a sermon you know, or a, a, a wedding sermon, you never hear in the presence of God, family, and friends, which is an oath, right? Do you take Christy to be your wife uh, in sickness and in health? You don't say, uh, you're going to take her unless she doesn't do this. That would be a disagreement. This is, hey, in sickness and in health. You know, it, it's also in, in joy as it is in sadness. It's, it's, a, it's a promise to love unconditionally. Right? Through thick and through thin, better and worse. To honor and respect, to laugh, to cry, to cherish this person for as both as you, long, uh, as you uh, shall live, as long as you shall live. And if I ever do that in a sermon, <laughs> don't hire me, right? So, but you never hear this as like, hey, do you take so-and-so not to kill you, to covet, to do this or that? Because if so, we're probably going to have to go ahead and cut this off. No, you, you have a covenant, and it's based on agreement. The problem is, is that too many people today, we don't see it as a covenant. We, we get married under the, the premonition that things are going to be different once we get married, 
based on that person having to do what I say they have to do. And instead of going into it with an oath of love and agreement, we go into it already ready to fight because we're doomed from the beginning. And it's a contract. The reason why I'm covering this is it's very important that we understand what a covenant is. It's an oath. It's a mutual agreement between two parties. And the new covenant is with Jesus. The old covenant is based on law. The new covenant is based on grace. The old covenant was rules. The new covenant was a relationship. Now the author, for the first seven chapters in Hebrew, Hebrews, he's talking about who Jesus is. I mean, talk about he has a love. He's just like I was 17 years ago. I still am, by the way, baby. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He's done nothing but talk up Jesus. He hasn't said anything about the finished work of the cross. He hasn't talked about what he does for us. All he's done so far is to call people dense, slow. You know, you need to get up and do something. And talk about how Jesus is exalted and greater than Moses and the angels. And then it, better than any old covenant. Tonight is different. Tonight, his love changes, and we start to turn the corner a little bit. And this is, this is hey, you can just say thank you right now, because a lot of times Scripture is really confusing. And, and, and Scripture testifies to Scripture in this, where, where Peter writes, and he's like, listen, Paul, good luck with that. Like, I don't even, I'm just a fisherman. <laughs> but tonight, tonight's Scripture is pretty clear cut. It's pretty clear, clear. And, and, and his love for Jesus goes from this is not just who he is, but this is what Jesus can do for you in your life. And so he starts kind of focusing on the grace and the love. And at the end of chapter 7, you started to see that. And now he's going to start talking about things like the covenant of Jesus is with grace and it's with mercy and it's with love. It's about forgiveness. It's not about the law. Forget about the law. Step into this new covenant. So let's go ahead in verse 1 of chapter 8. It says, Now the point... And what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So right now he's talking about, you know, Jesus is so great. Let's, in fact, here's how great he is. He's not even here. He's actually in heaven. A minister in the holy places, a true tent, which would have been, you know, you hear the tent of meeting in the Old Testament. That would have been tabernacle or the church or the temple. It says that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are, are priests who offer gifts according to the law. See, Jesus didn't do things by the law. He was from a new, a new provision, uh, provision from God, validation of God's movement here. He's saying, this is my son. This is who he is. Forget all that you think you know. He's not even from the Levitical tribe. He's not even from the Aaron priesthood. Who he is is my son. And the rules don't apply here. Go in verse 5. It says, They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, which where Jesus is, by the way. For when Moses was about to erect a tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And so the author is kind of setting it up that, hey, he's about to get to something big, but in the meantime, he's saying, hey, Jesus is so great. Here's why he's the high priest is because he's actually in heaven. And now when I heard this, I was like, well, hold on. We've all heard that Jesus lives in our heart. But I'd say this, Jesus physically lives in heaven. But the spirit of Jesus lives inside of us. And that's where it's at right here. And, and he's trying to explain to them that, hey, we, we're, we're looking at things on the earthly, in the matter of things. Like the temple, he's saying like, hey, if the temple or the tabernacle, when you go inside the outer gates, any believer, any Jew at the time could go in there and have conversations. And what he's trying to explain to them is that now that there's a high priest, things have changed. Whereas the old, you could go into the outer courts. Then there was another room inside with another curtain or a wall. And no one was allowed in there except for the high priest. And we talked about this last week. Here's, what, here's the way it worked is I sin. I go to the high priest. He takes my sin. He lays it against the law. And he says, let's take this animal and slaughter it for your sins. And he's the only one that can do that on my behalf once a year. And the author is saying that our high priest, our new high priest, you don't have to do that. In order to get, and, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, it sounds like we need someone to take something to the altar for us. <gasps> he did. He did, and that's what Jesus is doing. He's trying to explain to them, hey, the old way we're thinking about the temple, there is a new temple, in fact. 
There's a new tabernacle, and there is the innermost room that is still the most holy of the holies, and it's not a room, but it's the innermost place in your body. It's your heart. It's your heart, and he's trying to explain to them things have changed. It's not about the law, but it's about a relationship. And we're going to see as we go on today that things start to move from the mind and starts to be imparted into the heart with a relationship with Jesus. And, and I'd say this, that that veil, that wall, and, and if you've ever grown up in the church, and, and maybe you thought like I did, is that I have to take all my problems to the, to the priest. I have to take it to the pastor. I have to take it to the guy in charge. Not the 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 people they have on staff because they're not good enough to take my problems and my sins. <clears throat> and what we do is we, we, we put this person on a pedestal. We do, and, and it's not going to happen at our church. I mean, we set that standard pretty quick. And if, if you, know, you heard me speaking a little bit, you already know, like, I ain't taking my crap to him, right? <laughs> what I'm getting at is that you don't have to do that any longer is that you have a direct connection, that that veil has been torn, that Jesus took that down, and that we have a relationship with him, and that relationship replaces that sin or that, that sacrifice because he has atoned for all of our sins. That that sacrifice has been made once, and once for all. We no longer have to take our palms to someone once a year, but we can take it to him daily. So let's go ahead and go into verse 6. He, now, the author starts to explain to the Hebrew people that, hey, that the law is obsolete. The law is obsolete. Now, you're thinking, you're like, I don't know if that's right. Well, hold on. We're going somewhere with this, I promise. In verse 6, but as it is, Christ has, has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So this saying is like his atonement for our sins once and for all. I don't think any of us would disagree that the new covenant is much better for us. Unless you enjoy sitting there white-knuckling it through life and holding on to things as tight as you can and going, no, I must follow the law, I will follow the law, everyone else is wrong. No, I think it's pretty fair to say, like, no, th this way is much better. I only have to do it once, that I have to have a relationship and not follow the rules. It's not that you don't follow rules is that once you enter into that covenant, that mutual agreement of love with one another, those rules start to change, and they don't seem so much like rules as it is a way of life. And it's based on a relationship. In verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. And he's reiterating what he said in chapter 7, that if the law could make us righteous, Christ died for nothing. Because the law cannot make us perfect. In fact, it can make nothing perfect. But it wasn't the law. It wasn't the law itself that was faulty. It was us. God's law wasn't wrong. God's law wasn't bad. What was wrong and wicked and wrong, it was us. We couldn't handle it because we had something called the fall of man. Total depravity, which says when I wake up, I'm more prone to sin than I am to love most days. Because I'm born into a world of it. And he's saying that you no longer have to focus on those rules because it's not the rules that make you right, it's the relationship that makes you right. And here's why the relationship in the new covenant is so much better. It's because here's what the law does. The law will reveal to you what you've done right. And it will reveal to you what you've done wrong. But what it does not do is give you the power to enable you to change your life. It can just show you black or white. It's kind of like whenever you measure yourself on the wall, that ruler, it, it can tell you how tall you are, but it can't give you another inch. It can't make you shorter. It can't make you taller. I've tried. <laughs> so the law is no good. It's a relationship because when you enter into that covenant relationship with God, it changes things because you start to see things differently and your heart starts to change. That new covenant enables us through the grace. Through the grace that God gives us when we enter into that covenant. In verse 8, for he finds fault with them. Now he's pointing the finger. Who's them? Us. It's the people. He says, because of us, when he says, and now he starts to quote 
Jeremiah. In fact, this is the longest, longest Old Testament scripture in the New Testament. I know it's kind of tricky to say, but here we are in Jeremiah, and, and Jeremiah is starting to prophesy about how the Old Covenant is no longer going to be valid because there's going to be someone from the tribe of Judah come in, and it's going to change everyone's life. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant, which is Jesus, with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and, and led them out of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, so I showed them no concern for them, declares the Lord. What he's saying is that, hey, the new covenant is going to overtake the old one. And here's the reason why. It's because you have disobeyed me, and you have disregarded everything I've said. And it says that he shows no care for them. Basically what he's saying is like, hey, listen, I am remaining faithful. You're not remaining faithful to me. And by the way, there are consequences when we don't obey. You know what obey actually means when you're obedient? It means walking in agreement with God. What's a covenant? Mutually agreeing and loving with God. Think about the similarities there. And what God is saying, and it still holds true today, that just because you're in the new covenant, whenever you mess up and whenever you fall down, you don't get a free pass. You still have to answer for the things that you behaved yourself into. So, well, you got to pray. Yes, prayer will not get you out of something you behaved yourself into. Okay? Prayer may perform a miracle, and that may just happen, but I promise when you continuously mess up and mess up and mess up and you have chance after chance after chance, if you go out and do something silly, you're going to have to answer for that. I'd say that more than anything, we have laws and rules we have to obey here in this world. Just because you're in the new covenant doesn't mean that you get to disregard everything else. I mean, we look at the law so weird. Like, it's, it's, it's so set in stone in one situation, and the other situation is like, yeah, but it's just the law. It's like, which way is it? And I think tonight, I, I want to look at it from a different perspective. Let's look at it like this. Maybe the law wasn't given so we could be perfect, but it was there to reveal that we needed a Savior. It was setting something up. The law was there, and we could never once follow it. It's saying we weren't here to be perfect through the law. We were here so it could reveal a Savior. You know, last, last week we talked about that guy I know that went and spent some time in a monastery, and he had that monk. So I said, anytime you can quote a monk, you should do it. And so this is where we're at today, uh, two weeks in a row. And this monk said, he said, rules were made for man, but man wasn't made for rules. Again, it goes back to total depravity. It goes back to that person that uh, we're born into a world of sin, we're rotten until we give into that new covenant. We're living in that sin nature. We're living in that sin nature. And God's chosen people, the Israelites, they were given the law. They, in fact, it was very simple. Like here, Mosaic law, here's 10 of them. Follow those. Okay, no. They were so independent. They didn't like it. It wasn't done on their time. And I don't know if you can relate to this. It's like, Man, I want to live for God, and then we walk out of here and we get some bad news, and, and it's like we forget everything we said because now we start to panic, we start to worry, we get anxiety, we stress out, and we disregard this. We like we know what the word says, but they don't know what I'm going through. They don't know how sick I am. And God gives us chance after chance after chance. And the Israelites, they continue to do this and just bang their head against the wall. And we do this in our own life, but the new covenant says, you know what? Quit worrying about the laws, quit worrying about the rules, and worry about a relationship. My daughter, she's seven now. When she could first start to talk, man, she was super independent. I'll put it that way. And she could barely talk, but she had enough vocabulary to say this right here, this phrase. And she'd get this scowl, you remember that? She'd go, I do it myself. I do it myself. And she could be climbing on the counters trying to get a cup down, and she'd say, I do it myself. Oh, okay. She'd be eating something. She couldn't, the coordination wasn't there. It'd be going in her head and her eye. I do it myself. She's trying to tie her shoe. She can't even do Velcro. You know, and, and one of the toughest things as a parent that I've learned, I think most parents would agree, is to learn to step away and allow our children to suffer a little bit. 
to go through some tough times, to maybe even feel a little bit of pain in order for them to realize that they don't have to do it by themselves. Because after a little bit, because she had a temper, and she's like, I do it myself, I do it myself. And then she'd come in, and I remember she'd have like one button done out of like 15, and she'd be crying, and she'd go, and she did this thing with her hands, I don't know why, but she'd, she'd go, help me, Daddy. Help me, Daddy. Same as with our Father. We don't have to continue to bang our head against the wall. We don't have to continue to think that no one else is here to help us. He gave us a new covenant. He gave us a relationship that says, you know what, you fell down. Listen, I'm going to let you fall, and I'm going to let you have to answer for those consequences. But when you're ready and when you're exhausted, reach up, and I'm here. The problem is, is we get so frustrated or we get so beat down because things keep happening over and over and over, and we get discouraged by that. And we say, I give up on God. And I'd say, I don't even think we gave him a chance to begin with. I had a friend the other day, he sent me these lyrics to this song. And the lyrics is this, it says, Though I falter, you got me walking on water. And it's referenced the story when Jesus is walking on water and the disciples see him and, and Peter calls out and says, Call me to you. And Jesus says, Come to me. Just like the Israelites, right? Like, God is saying, come to me. But yet we, we push away. But Peter steps out, even though we're faltering, even though we continually fall down, he's letting us walk on water. And then something happens. Squirrel. And then we realize that we're in the middle of a lake. And we start to sink. And God doesn't go, oh my goodness, let me pick you up. He stood there, and Peter's freaking out, and he's going, and he looks up at, at the Lord, and he says, help me, help me. And it says that Jesus reached down, he said, you have little faith, but he, he reached down, and it says what? It says immediately, he was saved. Immediately. Don't get discouraged. Just because you've fallen down one time, ten times, twenty times, That's why it's so important that a relationship is not just with Jesus, but it's with people. Because whenever you get down and you push yourself away from people, you start forgetting how important their love and his love are together. And we start to isolate, and we don't hear anyone else's voice but ours. And usually it's not the conviction of the Holy Spirit that got you in the wrong direction. It's the other person. And you start to doubt yourself, and you start to think everyone's against you. And in fact, Jesus is waiting for you to go, Daddy, I need help. Daddy, I need help. The new covenant lets us go directly to him. No longer do we have to go to a high priest that takes it to us, takes it to God once a year. It's about having a relationship. It's about surrender, not sacrifice. It's about surrender, not sacrifice. Let's go ahead and continue in verse 10. And, and the author starts to change something here, and And it shows the four provisions with the new covenant. He shows four right here. In verse 10, he says, For this is the new covenant, Jesus, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know, for uh, they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Let's unpack that a little bit. The first thing I want to talk about, the four provisions. The first one that we see that God is giving us is a heart transformation. In verse 10, he starts saying that, hey, on the inside, with the new covenant, things are going to start to change. And this is what you should be experiencing. He says, he will write them on their hearts. The Old Testament, if you go back to Deuteronomy, it says that the law, it's written everywhere, man. It's up here, it's up there. Put it on your hand, put it on your sheet. Wherever you go, the law is there. Why? It needs to remind you that you can't do this, 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 and this. And if you do, you have to answer for this, this, and this. He's saying, listen, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to let you know on your mind, but I'm going to impart it into your heart. 
And that's what a relationship does. You start to see things differently because God is saying, listen, not only is it on your mind, hey, that's one thing, but he's going to get to the root of it. Because Jesus says, no, 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 no more. What we're going to do is we're going we're to get it at the, the root of the problem. Which several times in the gospel he talks about is the heart. And so he's going to start to transform our hearts. And it's by his grace and his love that it's written to our hearts. It's not... We're so smart. We're so smart. We have this heart transformation, and then something happens. We start to push away from other people because we start to figure out, there's a lot of knowledge here. Or we start to hang around other people and it's pushing us or dragging us away or, or even causing divisiveness in certain relationships. And, and you, you start to doubt what the Word says. Or you start to doubt those people that are pouring into your life. And it's not because of heart transformation. It's because you've got so much going on up here that you've, you've let it outweigh the spirit that's working in your soul. The second provision is this. He says that you're going to have an intimacy with him. You're going to have a re, a, a, an intimate relationship in this new covenant. In verse 10, he goes, And you shall be my people. I will be their God, and you shall be my people. I love this, because this reigns true all through our society, our culture, even at this church. This is all about belonging. It's all about belonging. Everywhere you go, if you're on a team, if you played sports growing up, or if you're still on a, an intramural team or whatever, hey, it's all about camaraderie. It's all about hanging out with those people that have a common bond, right, that are mutually agreeing on doing something. And it, what it does, it makes you feel like you belong to something. But think about it. In everything we do, whether it's, it's politics, it's school, it's sports, even fashion, people wear things so they'll fit in and blend in. Even at church, when people come here, we say at membership, this is not a place where it's a country club. This is a place to belong. To, to what? A family. A family. And nothing's changed about that. And one thing that, that reigns true about all churches, it doesn't matter where you go, people will not stay here. It doesn't matter how good the preacher is, how great the worship is, People will not stick around if they do not feel needed and they don't feel known. I tell people all the time, people aren't going to remember this message here. They aren't going to remember what I said, but they're going to remember the content of our hearts when they leave. They're going to remember how we made them feel, not what we say. People don't come to our church because, I mean, certainly it's not because of me. It's certainly not because of everything we have going on uh, as far as production-wise. What it's about is a relationship with God. It's a relationship with others. It's about belonging to a community that's going to stick beside you no matter what. And, and here's the thing is your relationship with God does not depend on your knowledge of God. What it depends on is an awakening of your soul by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not a one, two, three steps, and now I'm a believer. That's not how it works. What it is, it's a moment with God. And he's saying, from the greatest to the least of these. And for those of you who say, well, I don't know how this works. You, you're going to get a moment at the end here, and you could do it right now. Hey, you believe he is who he says he is, and he'll do what he says he's going to do. And you're going to tell someone else that. You step into a new covenant. And you will start to figure it out along the way. That's called sanctification. We'll get to that here in a second. But it's a moment. It's a moment. It starts with a moment. Quit getting it confused with, i got to go do this, 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 and this. In order to have a moment with God. No, it's an awakening of your soul. By the Holy Spirit of God. The third thing is this. He says, the knowledge of God. He says, know the Lord, for thou sh they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. This is also sanctification. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What that says is that you don't have to take this to a priest any longer. You take it to the only high priest, the one from the order of Melchizedek, the one that is not from the tribe of of the Levitical tribe or the Aaron priesthood, but the one that is from the tribe of Judah, which is Jesus Christ, that's who you take it to. 
Quit trying to do it another way. That's the kind of knowledge. And it's saying, hey, this is, oh, quit taking it to other believers. Quit trying to pull people from other homes. No, no, no you got to go do it this way. Listen, the Bible's pretty clear. We're to take this message to all ends of the earth. Not to the other Christian on the other side of town. Listen, our job is to preach and teach the word to those who don't know the word. Because how are they going to know it if we don't speak it? Get out of your comfort zone. You're like, man, I don't want to do that. Tough. If you don't want to do that, go somewhere else. We've got a core value that says we're going to step out in faith and out of our comfort zone. We know that God will grow us when we start to listen and we start to obey. <gasps> There's that word obey, which means to walk in agreement with God. Which means I'm stepping into a new covenant with God because I'm agreeing mutually. For my love for him and his love for me, not based on the rules, but based on his grace. I'm preaching myself happy today. Let's go here. Number four, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Thank God for forgiveness. In verse 12, he says, I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. That word iniquities, it doesn't mean sin. It means someone that's bent and going in the wrong direction. It means crooked. And when you're crooked, it ultimately leads to death. Because when it's not pointing to God, it's pointing to this world. And there's no life in this world. And he's saying that, God is saying, listen, I am merciful. Even when you're headed in the wrong direction. I love you so much that when you sin and you do things that you're not supposed to do, that I'm going to love you anyway. If you've never experienced that, maybe today's the day that you step into it. I heard this analogy this preacher used, and I'm going to use it. It's probably the best analogy I've ever heard. My son, who's four now, we, we were a little worried. He, he didn't start walking until like 14 or 15 months because I was like, daughter did it in nine and a half, buddy. What's going on? You know, <laughs> just kidding. But so he didn't walk until like 14 or 15 months. And when he started to take his first steps, we were celebrating. I'm calling my mom, my friends. I'm put, putting it on social media. Like Jojo walked today. Jojo walked. But what I didn't say was he took two steps out of momentum because he didn't know what he was doing and he fell down. I didn't say he fell down. And I didn't say it took another week for him to take another step. All I focused on was I'm proud of him for taking that step. And now he's four, so he's walking pretty good. I mean, every once in a while, his, his head's facing that way and his body's going that way, so he falls. And there, sometimes when he falls now, there's blood. There's a busted lip. There's a skint knee. And every single time he falls, I have never once walked over to him and gone, What did you do? I picked him up. I said, Where are you hurt? And I've kissed a lot of boo-boos. I've cleaned a lot of scraped knees. And I just console him. And I've never once gotten mad for the times that he's fallen down. But I've always remained encouraged by the steps he takes forward. You serve a God who is so merciful that whenever you do fall down, no matter how hard it is, because it could get bloody. And you could get scraped up pretty bad. You serve a God so big. Our God is encouraged because he's a merciful, graceful, non-vengeful, loving, loving God. And he says that you're going in the right direction. You almost got it. You're only three steps away. And as I'm holding my son something weird happens. He goes from I'm broken eyes, uh, screaming to realizing that he can run again. And I let go. And I watch. God is watching us and loving us. And he has his handprints and his grace and his love and his mercy all over our falls all over our steps. 
And it starts with a new covenant. It starts with a new covenant. If you're falling down, get up. Quit beating yourself up. Quit acting like God's against you because he's not against you. Bring someone into your life to show you that it's not because of your disobedience. It's not because of the, the laws, but it's because of God's grace. You're focused on the wrong thing. This is not a contract we have with God. It is a covenant. It's a mutual agreement of love between God and ourselves that says, your son is who he says he is, and I love him, and he loves me. And I am going to fall, and you are going to fall. And some of us right now are in a pit of despair, and that's where Satan lives. That doubt and that fear and that slum of life, thinking I'll never get out of this. Don't be the person, okay, because there's going to be two types of people tonight. There's going to be people that give up because they don't see Jesus, and I'd say it's because you've never tried Jesus. And I say also, there's going to be people in here that want life change, but they do not want the solution for the life change. The only solution is the new covenant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life you've given us and the new covenant and the, the grace and the mercy and the love that you offer every single day. Man, we are so blessed to to have a father that cares so much that he will let us scrape our knees, that he will let us fall down. And God, there are some people in this room, including myself, and and I just want to, everyone look up right now. Everyone look up right now. I've messed up this week. I know someone else has been hurting this week. I don't always do it this this right, but I'm going to tell you right now that God loves us so much. I'm going to raise my hand and let you know. I'm not staying down. Who's not going to stay down? Raise your hand right now and say, I'm just ready. I'm ready, like I'm done falling down. All right, let's continue to pray. Father, with accountability in this room, with the love and grace that we're showing one another as a family, the mercy that you've given us, the forgiveness that you've given us, there are people that aren't aren't wanting to stay down, but they're ready to rise up with a new life that you're ready to give them. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're ready to step back into his grace and into his love and into the new covenant, I want you to raise your hand right now. I want you to raise your hand. Say, God loves you. God loves you. Amen. God loves you. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you for spilling your blood and forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for making us brand new, God. We are so fortunate to have a God that loves us. And I pray that we can take this message, not inside these walls, but I pray that we can now take this message outside these walls. God, we love you. And we thank you. And everybody said, amen. Go ahead and stand up. Let's worship together. If you need prayer, come meet me right over here. If you gave your life to Jesus, if you're ready to get back up with Jesus, come talk to me. Even if you didn't raise your hand, there's people in the back. Don't miss out on the opportunity to drop that pride.
Before we get out of here tonight, I wanted to remind you that we're doing the hunt for Easter. We're going to be partnering with Canadian Valley Baptist Church. This is our chance to share the gospel of the community. If you're an actor, if you are a scene decorator, if whatever skill you have, sign up online, volunteer, and help us to minister to our community and help us to be a part of the hunt for Easter. Also, I want you to know we still have a need for CK volunteers. If you'll notice, our young ones aren't in here tonight, but if we don't get more volunteers, they might be next week. Uh, you can sign up for anything that we say here in the lobby. You can also sign up online. Like I said, everything I say tonight is going to be found online. We also have four ways to give here at the Good Fight Church. You can text, you can use the app, you can use a tithe envelope, and you can also go to the website. And I was reminded of this verse that tells us this. It says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whether that is your time, whether that is your emotion, whether that's your spiritual life, and yes, your finances as well. Wherever you invest yourself, all of you, is we're going to find your heart as well. Let me pray for this week. Bow your heads with me if you would. Father God, I pray that you would continue to go before us, Lord God, that you would continue to open doors, that uh, it's incredible to see your mighty hand at work. And Father God, I want to pray that we would be doing our part as well, that we would be loving, Lord, that we would be ministering, that we would be a light in this dark world, that we would be changed. Father God, that we would live in such a way that people see you in our lives. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength God, in the sense of purpose that we need this week to go out there and be conquerors, Father God. Christ, in your name we give thanks. Amen. Hey, let me tell you this. Thanks for being part of the family tonight. I want you to go out into this world and fight the good fight. We'll see you at our ministries throughout the week. Have a good night.